how do you get people more deeply connected with your universe? We're trying to make it innovative, we're trying to make it accessible, and by introducing story and a narrative thread through the whole Infinity multiplayer experience is something that we really wanted to put a lot of attention and detail into. If it's a universe that everybody wants to be really excited about, it's got to grow and evolve beyond just incredibly balanced suite of mechanics. It's got to speak to fantasy and what people want and what they expect. Something we really wanted to do with Halo 4 was to bring a new perspective to Halo multiplayer. Flight assassination! The high-level philosophy for multiplayer was that we wanted to unify the competitive and cooperative experiences under this one big narrative banner that we call Infinity. The Infinity is a UNSC ship that is home to the Spartan 4 program. Really try to contextualize multiplayer in such a way in which it doesn't feel like abstracted game mode off to the side. It feels very much part of the same universe. We knew we wanted to expand the audience as far as we could, but still satisfy the core as much as possible. We had to break everything down to line by line evaluation of our current scripts and redefine that core loop to not make it like Halo 2 or like Halo 3 or something in the middle, but make it Halo 4. Halo starts with a philosophy that we've upheld, which is that your gameplay mechanics are consistent across every mode, so they don't change. We want to give players the power to choose which weapons they take in. People have their own personal favorites. It's a growth system in that you're unlocking customizations for your character, you're unlocking new weapons and abilities, but that's also helping to train you how to use those over time. You have armor abilities and armor mods, which are sort of under the hood modifications to your armor that give you abilities, give you passive changes. And then that completely fit in with our new scoring system. There's a lot of actions players take in multiplayer that contribute but don't necessarily put a score on the board. Because of the objective medals and all the extra ways you can score in a match, no players are finishing the game with a zero. Hail. Man. So one of the big things for us was making sure that people felt involved, and felt like they could always contribute in some sort of way. You're getting rewarded for teamwork, your style, your kills, your assists, the objectives you complete. And as you do that, you're going to get medals that fill up your ordnance meter. Ordnance ready. Once your ordnance meter fills up, the UNSC Infinity gives you three rewards you can choose from. Those are going to be power weapons, power ups, or grenades, and you can call them down right to you. Request confirmed. We've added what we're calling a situational record. That's a replay of the person that just killed you and how they killed you. It just adds a bit more information for players. The matchmaking system has evolved to let us join in progress. Overall, this means players will be getting into games faster and more often. So the new CTF really focuses on trying to encourage a little more team play. In the past, there was a lot of dropping of the flag and changing of roles. Now when you pick up the flag, Carrying flag. you're 100% committed, and at that point, your role is now to deliver that flag. Your HUD will change to tell you exactly where the deliver point is. Everybody can see exactly what it is that they're supposed to do. If you don't have that flag, then you'll still get points for helping your flag carrier, driving him around, assisting him, saving his life, returning your own flag, defending your flag against the enemies. It's a much more intense experience for all the players. Enemy team scored. Probably the biggest focal change is that we're trying to build more vehicle-friendly maps, and then to go with that we've got a new mode called Dominion. Dominion is everything we loved about Big Team Battle mixed with objective-based gameplay. You have lots of vehicles, big power weapons, large maps, but now there's bases. As you reinforce the bases, then shields will come up, or you'll be able to activate turrets to kind of reinforce those locations. It's kind of like territories, but with a little bit more of a twist. Territory control. One of the biggest challenges was trying to get vehicle and infantry play to work really well on a large map that had a lot of interior space. In Longbow, for example, all the bases in Dominion are fully thought out features in the map, and that really lets you get that break in and defend gameplay. The idea was to try and make sure that the team started here or here. The paths that they could take in between involved great pinch points, places where the vehicles would automatically run into each other and jump over each other. Whenever we start a space, we need to concentrate on a few key things. One is that there's distinct landmarks everywhere you look, so you can orient yourself and you never get lost while you're playing. 
Two is that whenever you're moving from location to location, if you're jumping across a gap, that none of those jumps feel frustrating. So for instance, floods are a replacement for infection and players have higher jump height. Infected. We needed to make sure that we could make a map that you're always going to hit your target. You're always going to be able to move around smoothly. What is the spiritual successor to infection? We knew how popular this mode was. We knew it had a lot to live up to. So we didn't want it to just be a Slayer variant anymore. The ground up, it's a new script. It's its own mode now. And now when you're flood, you get this new character model. You get a big claw, which you can completely slice the survivors in half with. If you look at the model, there's a set of fingers gripping the top of it. The idea being it's kind of been an explosive growth. As soon as they get infected, it just kind of pops out of them. There's like little teeth inside now. In addition to all of the new elements that we're adding to Halo 4 multiplayer, we're bringing back and improving a bunch of old favorites. We're bringing back King of the Hill. And Oddball. With Oddball, we also want to incorporate all the elements for our new scoring system. We we're looking for ways to make it a team-based experience like never before. Instead of just running away and hiding, now players get points for passing, catching, intercepting the ball. It completely changed the landscape. We're working with Certain Affinity to build content for multiplayer. It's a pretty huge undertaking. Certain Affinity has been a great partner to 343 for many years. They worked with us on the Defiant Map Pack and Halo Anniversary. For Halo 4, they helped us with a bunch of multiplayer and Forge maps. And one of those maps will have a Griff Ball Court in it. Gain the lead. Forge is our tool set that allows players to customize their own levels. So we give multiple spaces that each have unique components that you can kind of mix and match to make your own layouts. We felt like a previous permutation of Forge wasn't necessarily the most accessible. The biggest thing for us was trying to increase the speed at which you can build things. We have a lot of new components. First is a magnet system, which makes it easier to line up pieces to each other. You see these little guys over here. These are hand-placed magnet points. Based on these points, you toggle it in the game and you can actually snap pieces together. Another thing that we have is the duplicate object tool. So if someone has a crazy idea, you can just place something. Oh, I have a mongoose. I can make six more of those. Whenever you exit your editing mode, you'll end up seeing shadows cast on the pieces that you placed. I can place a block sort of anywhere I want, and they'll just sit there. There'll be no shadow on the ground. It'll look kind of like it's floating, even though it's actually quite close to the ground. But then if I turn the lighting on, boom, you instantly get a shadow there. There's going to be things out there where we just end up scratching our heads, being like, how did someone do that? In the tradition of remaking maps, we've chosen to do Valhalla, and this time we're calling it Ragnarok. It is almost identical to the original layout of Valhalla. We fine-tuned things for jetpack and things like that. But the biggest change to this map is the addition of the Mantis. Mantis is probably the biggest new sandbox toy we have this time around. When you walk up to it, you'll see it sitting on the floor, and so you hop in this hatch in the back. On its right hand, it's got an enormous UNSC chain gun, and then on the left side, it's got a five canister rocket pod. You can use both weapons at the same time, and the rocket pod itself, you can charge up and actually fire all five rockets at once. The other thing that's really sweet with it is it has a melee stomp. This is probably the most powerful vehicle in a Halo game since like the Scorpion or Banshee. We knew from the start that we're going to put some campaign. We have to bring a multiplayer. What better toy do I want to use the battlefield in the back? When you look at Halo's audience, you've got a group of players that really gravitates towards campaign, and then another group of players that really gravitates towards multiplayer. The idea of knitting together the narrative and this gameplay experience was the genesis of where Spartanops came from. The narrative thread through Spartanops is absolutely huge. Six months after the events of campaign are over, the crew of the Infinity is going down to investigate Requiem. Some of the old hands here know what you're in for. The rest of you, you're due. And education. Each week you have a new episode of the series that's continuing to tell this evolving story. 
and then you have these five missions that tie directly to that episode. And actually, in some cases, you have a direct impact on what's happening in the next week's episode. There are both creative challenges and production challenges. One is it, it's just a huge amount of content. We have, you know, 50 missions that we're developing over the 10 weeks of the Spartan Ops season. We only have this much space, we only have this much RAM, we only have this much bandwidth. So we had to do a lot of technical trickery so that everything that we wanted to accomplish was able to happen. We want you to feel invested as part of the story. We wanted players to feel like they're accomplishing something. You rise up through the ranks and once you get up to 50, we have what are called specializations. Specializations are kind of the end game for your Spartan career. Each specialization has an armor set, a bunch of emblems, an armor skin, and probably the biggest thing is that you can also unlock an extra armor mod. You can actually have a little gameplay item. Are you a vehicle guy? Are you a sniper? Are you someone who wants to level up faster? We actually have a mod that lets you earn XP a bit faster. It's more about specializing how you play at that point rather than the core gameplay mechanics being modified. So all the choices that you're making carries into the Spartan Ops experience. I'm going to tune in every week. We'll experience the story together for the first time as friends, and then we'll go play together as friends. And so this sort of new version of the water cooler. Spartan Ops will be one of those pinnacle moments for us in the franchise of creating new expectations for gamers and really delighting people with just great new functionality. We're seeing just kind of the tip of the spear. Going where we want to go in the next steps is only made possible by building absolute confidence a hero is someone who takes action even though they have something to lose. You gotta have the gumption. You gotta have the confidence to go after it. No matter how deeply we explore the universe or how much detail that you find out about aspects of the universe, it's still bigger and more mysterious than any amount of information could ever give us. And I think that's how the real universe is super excited about where this game has evolved to. There's so much variation at all levels of the game that make it infinitely replayable. People play it and they say, man, that's great, I just want one more game, one more game, and another one, and just keep going. It has been sort of this puzzle that's come together person by person. To me, that's the most fun thing, is seeing people play it, enjoy it, have fun. And you know it just started with that single spark, that single sentence from one designer to another.